40 kilometers. What sort of evidence do we have for these climatic changes? Well, we don't really have evidence for sites underwater, or at least not direct ones. But what we do have is a great deal of evidence from, uh, for global climate changes over the long term. And we usually extract those from uh, very long ice cores in, for instance, Antarctica, and also marine cores off the coast of southern Africa and all around the world. We can extract little creatures. These are called forams, which are really very tiny. Um, they look like little grains of sand. But there's a great deal of information that's locked up in these little creatures. They're made out of calcium carbonate, and we can measure the oxygen and the carbon isotopes. And from that has been extracted a sea level curve for the last well, couple of hundred thousand years. And that tells us a lot about what sea levels were doing and what the ice caps at the North Pole and the South Pole were doing. Between 70 and 50,000 years ago, those ice caps were expanding. We're talking about a worldwide catastrophe brought about by monumental changes in climate. The world was in the grip of an ice age. The polar ice sheets had expanded southwards, locking up much of the world's moisture as ice. Deserts in Africa grew, and sea levels everywhere dropped, leaving caves on the South African coast high and dry. Inland, lush pastureland turned to desert, and prey became extremely scarce. Hunters who once had easy pickings now found themselves desperately searching for food. Humanity was on the verge of extinction. Miraculously, some were thrown a lifeline, that quantum leap in thinking, which meant a small band could now think the unthinkable and leave Africa forever. Where'd the next human remains outside of Africa turn up? The Middle East? Europe? India? No. Australia. You think that's impossible? I thought so too, but guess what? That's where our ancestors turn up next, and no one knows how. There's no evidence of a journey by foot, and 6,000 miles of open ocean tell me that sailing was out of the question. So how did the descendants of the Bushmen get to Australia without leaving a trace? Maybe the answer's there. Let's go find out. Australia, the most remote continent on Earth. Yet after our ancestors left their home, this is the very next place where we find their bones. How did they get here, and why is there no evidence of their journey? This is an absolutely extraordinary place. I've studied biology for nearly 20 years, and yet when I come here, I have to throw most of what I know into the bin. The animals and plants you find here are unlike those anywhere else in the world. That's because the last time Australia was connected to the other continents in the main line of mammalian evolution was over 100 million years ago. What this means for our story is that when we get to Australia, we find that humans are the only primate species living here. That means they must have come here from somewhere else. Mankind had to be an African import. The most obvious route would have been along the coastline of southern Asia, but so far there isn't one scrap of archaeological evidence that they came this way. Neither has a trace of their presence been found in the genes of those living along the route. Something doesn't add up. So I'm off to Lake Mungo in western New South Wales. I've come here to try and find out if the first Australians really show up as early as people suggest. Apparently many years ago I would have been walking on the shores of a lake. 
This was home to an ancient people, the very first settlers in Australia. I'm looking for their remains, but if these rocks hold any secrets, they're not telling me. It's not till I meet up with archaeologist Doug Williams that this place makes any sense. Through his eyes, a barren wasteland comes to life. If you know where to look, the blowing sands of Mungo can reveal precious archaeological treasures, long buried and last seen by an ancient people. Is that another lift? Yep, that's an artifact. That's a flake. Yep. Yep. Sometimes you can get stone tools that are being used for scraping wood or something a bit harder. Uh, tiny flakes would come off the, off the sharp edge. Mm -hmm. So what would it have been like living here for the people who, who made this thing? Oh, I think it would have been a, uh, yeah, a really quite a rich place to live. Mm. I mean, you look out across the lake, it would have been a fairly wide expanse of water. It would have been quite a, uh, quite a rich environment. Bit of charcoal or something. This is the remains of a of a small fireplace. You can see staining of, of charcoal in these in, in these darker patches and more generally through here. Yeah. Interestingly, yeah. it has these small bones, and it's actually a fish bone. Mungo is like this. A lot of the evidence we find is, you know, we're quite personal and poignant. You know, yeah. someone's a uh, uh, night in someone's life forty thousand years ago. Yeah, it's, yeah, pretty special. We were stepping back in time. A community, numbering as many as 200, lived here, eking out a living in this beautiful place. Suddenly, my lab seems half a world and tens of thousands of years away. But for Roy Kennedy, a descendant of these ancient Mungo people, this site feels like home. When I visit this area, and these burial sites around here, it's just like walking out to an ordinary cemetery and water in a grave. For me, it's very special. But how long ago did the Mungo people live here? The distinctive colored bands in the sand are the key to dating any find. The red layers date back over 100,000 years, way before any sign of human habitation. If you had to guess, knowing what you know about the site, what would you say? I'd, I'd suggest in the range of 30 to 40,000 years. It's incredible. I mean, it looks like it was done last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, certainly the bones are in good nick, aren't they? Yes, yeah. Yeah. They're incredibly ancient. The very oldest remains are dated to 40, maybe 45,000 years ago. Having been here to Lake Mungo, I am convinced by the dates. Humans clearly were living in Australia very soon after they left Africa. And yet, this only serves to highlight the problem. How did they get here so quickly? There's no evidence for a land journey. And a journey by sea? I just don't buy it. 6,000 miles of ocean is surely impossible. It's a long shot, but just maybe the descendants of those earliest settlers might hold a clue. Aborigines are famous for their tradition of oral history. They call them song lines, and they tell the story of their beginnings passed down by word of mouth through the generations. Perhaps there's something in their song lines that hints at a journey. Roy from Mungo. I don't know. That's a, that's a curly question, that one. I, I don't know. See, I, uh, I believe that we come from here, and I think I will always believe that. I've hit a dead end, but I've got the bit between my teeth and I'm heading north to Laura in Queensland. Do the rock paintings there hold clues to a possible migration? But hard as I look, I can't see any evidence of a journey. 
And when I ask Greg in a blood goodbye sing an aber